Um, so yesterday we had a look at uh, the rather technical aspect of the work. So how can we detect sleep and why is it important to detect sleep in a proper way? How do we define sleep in flies? Um, and then we described uh, how we perform, um, what is the best way to perform sleep deprivation and, and what kind of consequences you can expect <clears throat> from sleep deprivation, at least in, uh, in part. And today I want to give uh, some example of um, more molecular work that can be done on sleep in flies. And um, I'll sh talk about two stories. Uh, one is actually published, but the other is not. Um, and um, they both concern actually the regulation of sleep. Okay, so if yesterday we talked about uh, the, under the, the basic question and, and the first step to address this question, which is to define sleep, to start with. Today we focus instead of how is sleep controlled. Now, uh, we do know a fair bit about how sleep is controlled. At least we have a very <coughs> well accepted uh, theoretical model. And this is what we call the two process model. Um, according to the two process model, which was formulated in uh, 1982 by uh, Borbelli, um, Sleep is under control of two, as the name suggested, processes. One is what we call process C, where C stands for circadian. And the other is what we call process S, where S stands for sleep. Now, about circadian, we, you might know this. We, we, know, we know a lot. And we already touched slightly on this yesterday, but um, the circadian field has been extremely successful. In fact, it's probably one of the great success stories of Drosophila, not just neuroscience, but of Drosophila biology. Because virtually everything we know about circadian biology uh, comes from flies. And, and this is really one of those fields where then everyone else has just been reproducing what we found before. Um, <clears throat> in flies, we know obviously about the genes that control the circadian rhythms, but we also know about the neurons. Uh, we know that the circadian rhythm in flies is under control of a uh, so-called clock neuron group, which is a group of a handful of neurons, which mainly express PDF as a um, peptide, which then synchronizes uh, the clock um, throughout the body. Um, <clears throat> and we know that something similar happens conceptually, but also molecularly uh, in, in vertebrates. And so this is, is a very important component of uh, our behavior and, of course, of sleep. So circadian regulates when you're tired, when you're not tired. So this is the time of the day, you know, early morning, uh, 9, 10, where you are supposed to be alert. So enjoy this moment as long as it lasts. Um, and then if you had a rough night yesterday night, you'll see that after lunch, it'll be a bit trickier to stay awake. And this regulation is driven by the circadian rhythm. In fact, you can, even you humans, can undergo, say, an all-nighter and uh, sleep, don't sleep throughout the night. Comes this time of the day, you'll still be OK. And many people, if they do this for the first time, they will think, actually, I'm, I'm cool with this. I could do this more often. And then you know, the day goes by, you have lunch. And after lunch, when the siesta kicks in, then you realize uh, what, a, what big of a mistake it was. <laughs> and the same happens in flies, by the way. <clears throat> right. yeah, the other process is what we call process S, and, and it's what is regulated by the homeostasis. So it's actually what, eventually, will make you tired if you didn't have enough sleep. Or conversely, it's what will make you, you know, less prone to fall asleep if you had a long afternoon nap. So it's the body regulating its own amount of sleep. And we don't know anything about it, really. I mean, we know it exists. We know it's basically so universal to be considered one of the definition of sleep. Um, we know that in mammals it manifests itself not much in terms of sleep length, but rather in terms of uh, sleep depth. And we can measure the sleep depth using electrophysiological uh, correlates. Um, in flies, uh, we know again it exists because we observe it as a, as a way of a rebound. So we, we sleep deprive the animals and then the day after they sleep longer. Uh, <clears throat> It's not necessarily uh, that they try to recover all of the sleep loss, again, similarly to what happened in mammals. If you sleep deprived fly for 12 hours, they're not going to recover 12 hours, okay? They'll just recover maybe 60, 70 minutes, similarly to what happens to us. Um, but it's possible that those 60, 70 minutes somehow might have a function that um, tries to condense 
all the sleep they have lost within those 12 hours. We, we, we don't, just don't know. It, it really just goes back. This, the concept of homeostasis goes back to yesterday's uh, talk about why we sleep. Uh, what is it that the, 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 body, the body or the brain is trying to uh, capture on? Now, these two things integrate in this way. Uh, the circadian rhythm is very stable. You cannot really mess with it. But the uh, homeostatic process uh, is dependent on your previous activity. So if you don't have sleep throughout the night, uh, your pressure will build up. And the way uh, you, you should think about this is uh, um, think about a threshold, right, a line. And this line is the regulated, the position of this line is regulated by circadian rhythm. So the circadian rhythm goes, uh, what a sinus, will move the line up and down throughout the 24 hours. And then the, the other component, the process S, will might at one point intersect the line. If the process S goes above the line, then you feel tired and you want to sleep. As long as the process S is below the line, you don't. And so the combination of these two, meaning the time of the day and how much the process S goes up, will determine whether you, um, uh, you know, want to go to sleep or not. And there seems to be a point during the day where you're, uh, especially in animals, maybe a bit less so in humans, where the circadian really uh, reaches a point, a threshold, that no matter how long you've been awake, you'll never be able to reach. So there is a point, for instance, in Drosophila, where I mean, you've, you've seen it yesterday, even though you have, the flies had uh, 10 days of sleep deprivation, they still want to go uh, around and move. So that's how they integrate at the kind of conceptual level. But what does it mean at the biological level? What, how does this integration then uh, converge at the biological level? This is one of the things I'm going to uh, talk about today. The other thing that I want to talk about is that um, this um, integration between the process C and process S into regulating sleep and activity does not really explain the common sleep problem, if you think about it. Okay, so if, if there's literature about, are, are people happy about their sleep pattern? And 70% of the Western society will tell you no, they're they are not. They don't get enough sleep, or they get sleep at the wrong time of the day or night or whatever, so they're just not happy about the sleep habits. And those who cannot fall asleep, for instance, they basically hardly ever can have problems with process S or process C. It's not like they have a problem with circadian rhythms or they have a problem with the homeostatic regulation. If they cannot fall asleep, if we cannot fall asleep, it's because we have other problems, because we are, we are stressed at work, because we are tired with children, because we are in love, and too much in love at the beginning, or we are in love but the other person is not. Um, and so there are all these kind of issues that then condition your, your mental health or in a way so that you know, eventually it will affect your sleep. And, and this thing, this aspect, which we, you can call environment, um, uh, I call it environment and emotion, so propose a process E, is not formalized into two process model. So the question is, do we have to think about a three process model that then takes this into account as well? So to address this question, we turn to our favorite organism, and we looked at how social interaction modifies sleep needs. And we looked at uh, two ways of social interaction. Um, there's a male-female interaction, so we call it, in this work we call it romantic interaction, and male-male interaction, which as you know is often aggress aggressive. Right, um, how do we do this? We use um, those machines we described yesterday, the etoscope, and the paradigm is, uh, is very simple. We basically, in all experiments, we use the same recording setup that I um, normally employ for just regulating sleep. But this time, for at least uh, 24 hours throughout the protocol, we actually had what we call interaction. So the experiment is done basically by putting a naive fly in a tube, um, uh, same as yesterday. When we want really to uh, achieve a real naivete, we just put the pooper, in fact, inside the tube. Um, so we take the pupae before, you know, as they develop, they put them into the tube so that the flies are actually born into the tube. The, the, the tube is their world. That's all they know about the world. Um, they, they then record sleep for a baseline period in those conditions. And then on interaction day, we gently insert an intruder into this tube. And the intruder can be another male or a virgin female. And so then they have this kind of interaction. With the females, obviously, they, so they think that it's going to be fun and they're going to 
24 hours to basically court continuously. And for the male, uh, it's going to be a kind of an aggress aggressive interaction because it's, um, uh, it's an interaction force in a very contained space. Right? So that there's not really much room to go. And they share the same side of the food. So if, if they want to eat, they have to be, only one person can eat, a, only one fly can eat at a time. So it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's an ideal um, setup for creating an aggressive style interaction. After the interaction, we remove the intruder, uh, which we recognize usually because it has a different eye color or different sex, of course. And we measure what happens next. And so when we've done this experiment the first time, this was actually an experiment that was done uh, when I was posted, in fact, in, initially. Um, <clears throat> we found a um, surprising result. So I'm going to show data in this format, which is similar um, to what you've seen today, but uh, a bit more um, spelled out. So the baseline is, again, the sleep, the undisturbed sleep. Then this is the sleep that happens during the interaction day. And, and rebound is shown as a profile, but also as a quantification, at least in the first three hours of the day. And you'll see that in, in all cases, we have gray as a control. So these are flies that underwent the same manipulation, but then we didn't end up putting any intruder in the tube. Uh, blue is a uh, male-male interaction. So that's the aggression interaction. And this uh, kind of pinkish is the male-female interaction. In all cases, we record the male, okay? The first, the, 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 the first male that was even the best one. And you see that the interaction is um, basically um, already different. Uh, in the case of male-female interaction, you be, these animals basically, they, they completely lack sleep. It's an, it's, it ends up being a very efficient sleep deprivation technique. Uh, and this is, in fact, the reason why I had done these experiments in the first place when I was a poster, because I was looking for a, way, a different way of doing sleep deprivation than just the earthquake system that I showed you yesterday, something that was a bit more challenging intellectually than just being shaken around. And, and, and it, this worked quite well. Um, <clears throat> and there, actually, I focus on the main main interaction, where you see that there is a bit of sleep deprivation, um, but not as efficient as the, uh, apparently efficient as the um, main female interaction. Now, the interesting bit happens the day after, though. If you look at the rebound, when you remove the intruder, you see that there is a difference. So the male-male interaction will lead to a rebound. So if you look at the, the blue line compared to the gray control, you see that the blue flies, they sleep longer at this time of the day. So they have what we call a proper rebound. But the male-female interaction does not. So if you quantify this, you see that statistically, the male-male interaction is higher than the control, but the male-female interaction is identical to the control. So the main female interaction, even though the sleep deprivation uh, is very efficient, does not lead to a rebound. And that was, is, you know, is, was the initial finding, was very puzzling. It tells you two things. It tells you, first of all, that yes, you can modulate sleep uh, with social cues. But most importantly, it tells you that you can, those social cues can also modulate how the body then respond to the sleep loss. And um, uh, this is uh, something that is then important because it, 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 makes, it makes a link, direct, a direct link between social, in this case, interaction and the process sense, the homeostasis. And so we, we, we did a, a bit more experiments on this. First thing we did is, uh, you know, we, we wanted to properly quantify the behavior of these animals, make sure that, you know, we were looking at the right thing. So we actually scored a number of them. I think this is uh, 12 and 12 animals along the uh, 24 hours. Uh, divided uh, by uh, behavioral type. This was done actually manually. It was not done by a machine, just to confirm that the machine was getting the right data. Um, and you see that um, the males uh, show quite a bit of fighting here and there. Uh, they tend to be uh, generally isolated from each other, so they look at each other. Uh, they don't move too much. Uh, it's not, in fact, totally clear whether this is real sleep or whether they simply just freeze in front of each other and, you know, wait for the other person, for the other fly to make the first move. It's totally possible this is the case. Um, we, in the male-female interaction, the other end, is, is just clearly obvious. They, they keep, basically most of the activity you see is, is courting, okay? What, what you see is the male chasing the female continuously and continuously and continuously. Uh, the, the female is virgin, so she's going to be receptive. Within the first hour usually, uh, one, and a, one and a half hour, you have the first event of copulation for pretty much all the pairings. All the pairings we analyze have copulation within the 
one or two hours. Uh, some of them managed to get late twice. Uh, I think there is a lucky guy who gets to three times uh, here. Um, it's very rare, um, but in that environment it does happen, even though you know, the female will reject at the point. But uh, what you see clearly is that, especially in the day when they also have the visual cue, uh, it's a basically 100% constant courtship that they undergo. So it's, they it's, it must be really tired, tiresome to just go after the female and, and keep courting and courting and courting, being rejected most of the time, in fact. But it, why then that doesn't, this doesn't lead to, to a, a rebound? Right, so we started to investigate the possible causes, and we basically repeated this experiment that I show you in different moods and background. So what are these? Um, dance and rutabaga, they are uh, very well-known memory mutant. These are flies that have problems remembering, okay? And so we thought, maybe when you remove the females, these flies, they are in love, and they remember their, their, their previous encounter the day before, and that's all they can think about, and they cannot fall asleep for that. And so we thought, maybe it's memory involved. So we done, did an experiment with dance and rutabaga, and the answer appeared to be not really. <clears throat> so we, we then assumed that perhaps was something linked to the communication between the two animals. And so we started looking at the uh, genes or factors that uh, have to do uh, with, um, with uh, odor communication. So the first experiment we've done is we, in, 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 the, in the classical, well, in the kind of normal condition, we also add a female of another species. So we add a female of um, Drosophila simulans. Now, the, the, the male uh, flies, they, they do court, and they also do mate with um, Drosophila from other species. Uh, but they need a stronger incentive to do that. So as long as they are in a confined space like this, they recognize that this is a, you know, a female. Um, maybe she smells a bit differently because it's not no gaster, but you know, still, it will be are still courting most of the time. Uh, however, what we saw in this case is that after uh, a day of courting with simulants, the rebound was actually there. Okay? So you don't get the same phenotype with simulants that you get with a melanocaster female. So it tells you that something about the, there is something species-specific about this. And so that was the first clue that the communication, for instance, uh, pheromonal communication could, could be involved. And what we ask, is this some uh, cue that is left, uh, like a factory cue? You can test this by uh, using these flies. This is a so-called orco mutant. Orco is a gene that works as a co-receptor for all your factory receptors in the fly. Uh, it's also known as uh, ORT3B. Uh, it's a very important gene because it's conserved uh, across evolution, so it might be, for instance, very crucial to uh, study uh, mosquito and malaria spreading. So if you, you know, our mosquito recognize our smell and the blood, uh, uh, the smell of the blood, um, <coughs> we'll probably go through uh, some orco e uh, equivalent. So it's been studied a lot. And we know that orco flies are completely anosmic. They just cannot smell anything. But yet, the phenotype we see in orco flies is really um, the same that we see in wild type flies. So the, the cue that we're looking for is not a olfactory cue. Um, <clears throat> could be a gustatory cue, and more specifically a sex pheromone. It makes a lot of sense. After all, it's a sex phenotype we're after. And so this is the experiment we've done. Uh, we have a control, male-male interaction, and male-male interaction where the tube was smelling of this. And this is basically a, you know, the secret to uh, uh, successful courtship. It's the, the smell of a, of a, of a, of a uh, female fly. It's the combination of the two main uh, pheromones that recognize uh, uh, Drosophila melanogaster female. So when you put this into the tube, what happens the, the day after the interaction, what happens is that you suppress the rebound. Okay? So even though the male had the usual aggressive interaction that will lead to a rebound, when the smell is present into the tube, suddenly something changes, they get excited, and they don't want to fall asleep anymore. So that tells you that a sensory stimulus, the day of the rebound, can actually suppress the rebound itself. So um, we wanted to check whether this was uh, completely independent of any social interaction. So we've done this experiment where we actually subjected the flies this time to dynamic slip deprivation. Dynamic slip deprivation is the name that we give to this uh, cube rotation thing that I showed you yesterday. It's just called dynamic because the slip deprivation happens 
when the flies are actually <coughs> asleep and not all the time. So it's, it's, it's kind of controlled. And so you see again, gray is the control animals, and red is the flies that underwent the dynamics lit deprivation. And in, these are three experiments. In all cases, these are wild type Cantonese flies. What changes between these three experiments is the tube in which they end up the day after the sleep deprivation. So they do the sleep deprivation in the normal tube, and then after the sleep deprivation, we uh, briefly move the flies to a new tube. And the new tube could be uh, actually the same tube, so it's just a mock act of moving them, that's the proper control. Or it could be to a new tube that has been just freshly prepared the day after, but no one has lived there, a new house. Or we put them to a tube that until minutes before had housed a female fly. So that's a tube that smells like a female fly. And what you see is that you do have a rebound in this case, you do have a rebound with a fresh tube, but again, you do not have a statistically significant rebound when you put in the uh, tube that smells like a female. So it's a confirmation that this uh, cue of suppressing rebound comes from the, the smell of the female. So how do flies detect the smell of the female? It's actually, I'm saying smell, but it's not a smell. It's a gustatory input, as I said. And comes is detected by, mainly by the tip of the legs. So you, you might know that, uh, how the courtship sequence evolves in, in flies. Um, the first step um, between a male and a, and a female fly is uh, orienting. So the male has to actually understand what the female fly is. Then he will approach her, and he will start touching her. It was called tapping. And the tapping is for testing the fly to make sure that she is of the right species. So you know that all pretty much all insects, but flies and uh, all kind of flies for sure, can taste through their legs. Okay, when they walk on your food, they're actually testing your food. And so they taste the female this way and they make sure she's in the right species. If they get this signal, the sexual arousal starts, and then the, the process of courting starts, and then they will sing the courtship song. Uh, the courtship song is the way for the female to recognize the male as of the right species. If she's, here, if she's hearing the right song, she will then accept uh, the male as a partner and, and they copulate. And so this tapping is the first step for the male to recognize the, gust the gustatory stimulus. It starts from these neurons, which express the PPK23 um, um, channel. And it goes to this neuron in the ventral nerve cord called PPN1. And the PPN1 neuron projects to the neurons in the brain called P1. The P1 neurons are the main, are, ought to be the main uh, fruitless expressing sex promoting neurons in the male. Okay? So they are very important. If you excite the P1 neurons, the flies get basically very aroused. And so given that we knew about this uh, pathway, we started playing with it. And so the experiment we did is, uh, as you can imagine, just excite using uh, what we call thermogenetics, so 3 phase one channels activated by temperature, excite the PPK23 neuron. And so we use the PPK23 GAL4 uh, to express 3 phase one and then we did uh, the usual experiments Baseline, sleep deprivation, you see efficient sleep deprivation in these flies. And then at the end of the sleep deprivation, this time we did not change tube, all we did was to raise the temperature in the incubator. By raising the temperature in the incubator from 25 to 29 degrees, you now activate the signal coming from the PPK23 neurons in the forelegs, and the flies feel like it's a bit of a synesthesia, I think is my best description. Uh, so it's, it's all in their mind. You have this, this deprivation, then you raise the, the temperature, they feel in their forelegs as if a female fly was there, and that's enough to suppress the bound. Okay, you see the bound in the parental controls. In these conditions, they are not affected by the temperature raise, but you do not see the bound in the uh, experimental flies, which is pressed the one and the L4. Okay, this is controlled, obviously, with a similar experiment where you go from 25 to 25. It's all, <coughs> all right, so um, we know that this has an effect. We just wanted, for the sake of it, to see uh, whether we can also elicit the same effect with uh, higher uh, neurons in the brain. And so conveniently, we can use the P1 neurons, as I said, which is very strong uh, activator of sexual uh, behavior. And so we do the same experiment, again, with 3 one but this time we drive 3 pay one with a P1 driver, um, and the experiment is here, baseline, and then induction day, again, this time there is no sleep deprivation in terms of mechanical or social, but what we do is we raise the temperature, P1 neurons in the brain get activated, flies get horny, they feel like courting nothing, because there's nothing to court, 
and that's enough to get a very efficient state deprivation, which really recalls of the male-female interaction, if you remember. Then we switch the, the temperature back to 25 degrees, so the P1 neurons are possibly you know, back to normal, and we look what happens at the rebound. And you see that the rebound is actually gone. In fact, it's even lower than control. There's even less than control. So some kind of arousal persists in these flies. Uh, it could be residual activity of the PM, PM neurons. Um, I don't know. I mean, you could really look for that. But um, definitely, there is a negative rebound. In fact, in, in, in the night, there is a bit of a negative rebound. And you see, you see 25 here is very staggering. <clears throat> so that, again, goes in the same direction. We wanted to go one uh, farther step, and we then looked at flies that we now have are mutants for their normal way of uh, showing a sexual arousal. And so we used, uh, conveniently, there are two mutants in, the, in this pathway, um, which are actually mutant in the, in, um, in the pathway that produces uh, octopamine starting from tyrosine, okay? This is, uh, there's mutants in the TDC pathway and mutants in the TBIH pathway. Sorry, in the TDC gene and TBA gene, both in the same pathway. Uh, one, uh, the, TDA, the TDC mutants will lack tyramine and octopamine, while the TBH mutants will only lack, lack octopamine eventually. And why did we use these flies? Because it was shown before that these flies have a different uh, complementary uh, phenotype when it comes to sexual behavior. So <clears throat> the um, TDC mutants they are actually uh, ex extremely arousable, and uh, um, they uh, court other males. They're so aroused that they, they are you know, happy with other males too. And, uh, um, and so what we've done is we repeated this experiment in this context, and you see exactly uh, the, same, the same phenotype. So the, 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 the TBH mutants, they are extremely aroused towards other females. Uh, the TDC tumor mutants, they are aroused towards everyone. Okay, so in the, in the TBH mutants, what you see is the regular um, um, sleep deprivation towards females, and then again, the rebound is not just gone, but it's annihilated. It is basically no rebound uh, after the male female interaction because they are so just hyper aroused to start with. And the TDC mutants, on the other end, uh, they lack rebound also after the male male interaction because they sh do show signs of core or courtship with my age group. So it just tells you in general that, um, altogether it tells you that the, the, the arousal state of this animal has a clear connection to regulating sleep homeostasis. And so in our mind, this is the first evidence, uh, at least in terms of um, you know, circuits and biology, that a process C is definitely something we might want to talk about. And as I said in the beginning, is, uh, is, it should not become a, a surprise because uh, we all experience uh, this on our skin. If we cannot fall asleep, it's not because C or S, it's because emotions and environment. And so it, one reason why this is particularly important uh, at this um, point in time is that we live this uh, very fortunate age of uh, optogenetics and thermogenetics where you can take any GAL4 you want, we have collections of thousands and thousands of GAL4, activate those neurons, inactivate those neurons, and look at the phenotype. And uh, if I were to take the PPK23 GAL4 neurons without knowing where they were, activate them, flies don't sleep, they don't have rebound, I say, that's it, I found sleep regulating neurons. While in fact I have not, I have found sex regulating neurons, which then modify the state of the fly. And we don't know, you know, there's an old essay called uh, What is Like to Be a Bat? An essay about consciousness. And uh, we can translate and say, What is Like to Be a Fly? We don't know what happens when you activate a GAL4 neuron. If it is a GAL4, usually, if it is a neuron that we know is in, involved with circadian rhythm, we say, OK, if we, if we fit this in the process C, OK, it must be a circadian neuron. If it's a neuron that we don't know what it does, we tend to fit it in the process S. And so there are a bunch of papers that are in the literature saying this is the homeostat neuron, it's the neuron regulating uh, sleep homeostasis. Maybe it's the neurons regulating how stressed flies are or uh, how horny flies are. Uh, you don't know, you don't really know how, you know, unless you ask them or unless you look for the other phenotype. And so it's a good caveat to always have for a formal reminder that neurons can fall in different categories. There's also another aspect that I like about this story, which is uh, 
um, you know, it, it might open the window to study something like emotions in flies, because uh, emotion is something that you might think you won't be able to study in animals, right? not easily at least, definitely not in flies. Uh, but uh, if you have a quantifiable output of the emotions, in this case, leap is a very quantifiable output, then you might be able to do so. All right, so this is uh, one part of the story. Briefly, I want to continue with uh, um, another part, which is, again, link uh, on, uh, on, on, on this. Um, so we, we accept that there are three, uh, well, two for sure, but possibly three processes contributing to the balance between sleep and activity. And as I said to you, um, how, how does it, what does it mean in terms of uh, biology, in terms of cell biology? So, okay, how does it translate, how does this translate, translate into a, you know, a diagram containing neurons and genes? And does it mean that there are neurons inter interacting with other neurons and sending signal to each other? Um, or is there a common signal that is shared by both? Um, the mammal literature is not helpful for that. We just don't know what, uh, what it is because we don't know any sleep controlling neuron in terms of homeostasis in mammals. Uh, it was proposed many years ago that there is a, a so called sleep factor, a factor S. And this was done uh, actually in Italy, experiments in Pisa, uh, where uh, <coughs> people basically sleep deprived cats. And then remove the cerebrospinal uh, fluid from sleep deprived cats and injected the same fluid into an animal that was not sleep deprived. And as soon as they were doing this, the animal that was getting injection would fall asleep. As if you, they were transferring something that will carry information about how, how tired you were supposed to be. And we don't know exactly what that factor is. We have a very good uh, evidence that this might be adenosine. Uh, so adenosine uh, is meant to be this sleep factor. Uh, it makes sense because if you inject adenosine, you recapitulate the same phenotype. The animals will want to fall asleep. Um, it makes sense also because the adenosine receptor is the caffeine receptor. So we know if it's pharmacological in the pathway. There are other issues with these experiments though because the adenosine knockout mice, they don't really have a strong sleep phenotype. Uh, and so either there is something missing there or adenosine is not the one. <clears throat> and so we, you know, in, in investigating how these processes involve each other and whether there is a factor that regulates sleep pressure is a very important task. So we, we stumble up actually uh, on something like this, um, starting from a slightly different story. So this, this story started uh, from looking at uh, the literature and, uh, and this is the first, it's an important paper, because this is the first paper ever published containing a uh, Drosophila sleep mutant. Okay, it was published by um, Chiara Cirelli and Giulio Tononi. Uh, I think it was 2001, 2002, can't remember. Um, it's say, a very important paper. Uh, they found the shaker channel, potassium channel, voltage gated potassium channel had a short sleeping phenotype. And they found shaker by looking at um, basically a population of several thousand flies that came from a screening. Okay? So this is females, male, sleep amount, and shaker seeds here. Uh, so shaker male flies get something like 300 minutes of sleep a day. Um, females get a bit less, 200 minutes of sleep a day. Now keep in mind that this is sleep that was recorded using the trichinetic model, the ones in, in the practical week yesterday, okay? So 300 minutes a day is probably way more than, than what they actually sleep. Well, not probably, sure, way more than what they actually sleep. And it's the sleep profile of the shaker mutants. Okay, so what, um, what, is, a, what is the shaker um, gene? A shaker gene is a conserved gene, is a, say, voltage-gated potassium channel. Uh, it's present throughout evolution. And it's composed of, in fact, um, at least two different um, protein types. There's the shaker proper, which uh, builds the actual channel through which the ion go through. And then there is a, a, a subunit called beta subunit, of, beta subunit of, the, of the channel, which in flies is called hyperkinetic. Now, this uh, hyperkinetic is, um, is a cytoplasmic protein. Um, it binds the alpha subunit, so the shaker proper, and regulates whether shaker opens or closes. And it's a special enzyme because, it's a special protein because it's actually an enzyme belonging to a family called um, aldocatoreductases, abbreviated with AKR. 
Um, so <clears throat> aldoketoreductases um, are enzymes that reduce an aldo group into a keto group. And they are, um, there's many of those genes. Uh, they are, they, what they are described in what is called a super family. There's uh, hundreds and hundreds of these genes across uh, all the species. They're very conserved. Um, and uh, they act on a number of different substrates. They actually are interesting pharmacological target because they often act on drugs when you get them. So, um, One peculiarity they have is that they pretty much all use NADPH as an agent for this reduction. Okay, so NADPH is the cofactor. A, a small amount of IKRs use NADH, but it's a relatively small fraction of genes. Well, what we, we were interested then in, uh, in, in, in these genes, because we ask, you know, if hyperkinetic is an AKR um, and uh, regulates shaker through AKR activity, does it mean that AKRs are generally important in regulating sleep? Or is just hyper, hyperkinetic is a, is, a, is a special case? So we looked at the database and we found that fly melanogast that has, uh, I think, 11 or 12 AKR genes, which are depicted here. So hyperkinetic here, hyperkinetic is a special kind of AKR um, because of its function. Um, all the others are clustered pretty much all the way around. Uh, this guy here is expressed only in the testes. Uh, so we, uh, under control of the Y chromosome, expressed only in the testes, so we didn't consider it. But the other ones we did, we obtained uh, RNA lines and we did a, a small gal 4 screen, dri driving the RNA lines in the uh, LAV uh, neurons, so that means panneuronally, all neurons in the brain Postmitotically express the GAL4, and they're going to knock down whatever uh, AKR gene you look at. And we look at them at sleep, sleep time over 24 hours in all of this condition. And we found three cases that were statistically strong. One was hyperkinetic itself, and that is sleep phenotype, um, a bit during the day, but also especially during the night. And the other two both led to this gene, it's called CG10638. Um, and they had a phenotype, one during the night mainly, and the other during the day and during the night. Now, what is this uh, gene? Um, this gene is, uh, um, is an AKR, of course, and it's uh, um, a very interesting gene because it has a peculiar structure. Um, the, actually, the two RNAi that gave us a phenotype target two different splicing isophores um, that are produced by this gene. So um, this gene has this Genetic, genomic structure. There is only one common exon here, indicated in green, which uh, encodes something like 27, 26 amino acids. And then the two isoforms, isoform A, is encoded mainly by this, actually, or exclusively by these um, exons here. And isoform B is encoded by these exons here. So this, uh, the alternative splicing happening here regulates it whether you get this isoform A or whether you get the isoform B. And um, because this uh, gene has um, Sleep phenotype, we, we call it Nina Nana, which is an uh, Italian term for lullaby. And it's a convenient name, at least for, you know, uh, if you're familiar with language, because then it allows you to uh, also nickname the two isoforms. And we call this Nina and this Nana. Okay? So I know it, it might get a bit confusing at one point for not Italian speakers, uh, but it's cute, I can assure you. Um, all right, so what about Nina and Nana? We started doing, um, we made antibodies against both proteins, and we started looking at whether with they express. And we found, to uh, um, great surprise, that Nina is expressed in the circadian neurons. Okay? So I told you that the circadian clock in Drosophila uh, largely expresses this uh, PDF factor. So we have PDF uh, antibodies, we have PDF GAL4 lines, and we found that Nina, and you see it, uh, what is it here, is expressed in the large L LMDs, okay? So the PDF neurons divide themselves into two groups, the small LMDs and the large LMDs, and Nina is expressing only in the large LMDs. We do see some staining in the, uh, in the small LMDs of both Nina and Nana, but it's, it's very faint. You know, when you make the antibody yourself, you'll never really be total sure. So for now, we call it as just to express in the large, Nina express in the large LMD. We, we're pretty confident that this is the case. We can confirm it by using a GAL4 insertion and you see a very strong overlap in the large LMD between uh, the GFP driven by the GAL4 insertion and the anti-PDF antibody. So it's uh, clearly expressed in the large LMD, which are here. 
and you can use pdf cal 4 to drive down uh, the NINA expression and you get a sleep phenotype during the night. Now, you might think that the sleep phenotype is nothing to write home about, it's not particularly strong, but in fact it's as strong as it gets if you were to completely ablate those neurons. Okay, so those neurons, they are known, they're known to have a role in regulating sleep during the night. If you completely get rid of them or silence them, you get a phenotype which is like this. So it's, it's quite a strong phenotype considering that. All right, so NINA is expressing the Sid Canyon uh, neurons. Uh, what about NANA? Um, NANA, conversely, has a very different expression. It's mainly expressed in a, um, <clears throat> in a, in a, in a, in a handful of neurons situated in this area of the brain. Uh, the cell bodies here, one here, one here, and then they project uh, axons across each other, and they see dendrites from the higher part of the brain. Here they do a, a small uh, round, uh, a small circle around the, the peduncles of the mushroom body. <clears throat> and um, what we've done, we screened through the VT collection in Vienna. We obtained a Galfour line that recapitulated this expression, and we found this line conveniently. So this is the same neuron. If you stain for GFP, driven by the VT Galfour, 4 or for NANA antibody, you see that they overlap. So luckily enough, we found a Galfour 4 driver. We, driv uh, the, uh, we drove the uh, RNA using this Galfour, 4 and lo and behold, we found a slip phenotype uh, again. So if you knock down NANA in these neurons, you get a slip phenotype. Right, so that's interesting. Same gene, two splicing isoforms, different expression pattern. Um, these uh, neurons, these we call nano neurons, they, they, we were not the first ones to identify them. Uh, they were identified before. Uh, this is one of those cases where you just have to go through old paper and say, I think I've seen this pattern before. And then you test your memory as a, as a reviewer and reader. And I found these two papers, um, maybe there's more. Um, in this paper, these neurons were identified and called IPS neurons. And they are the same, you see that they do the circle here. And in this paper, they were called ICLI neurons. Again, they go up and they do the circle around the mushroom body. So these are the, well, potentially the same, the same neurons. So to make sure they, are the, they were the same neurons, we basically looked at this literature. We looked at what kind of um, markers were characterizing these neurons. We did the staining. And in, in, in fact, they were the ones. So uh, they match both the tyrosine marker and the MIP marker. And so the match total, they are the same neurons. And these neurons were, which uh, you can call the ICLI, you can call the IPS, you can call nano neurons at this point, you can call it whatever you want. Um, they were identified before as regulator of, in fact, sexual arousal. Um, so they, they probably neurons that regulate whether you should you know, uh, be sexual aroused or not. Now, uh, if you put them, overlay them uh, together, the NINA neurons in blue here, and the NANA neurons in uh, purple, you see that they are actually quite close. And so the question is, are they close enough to actually make a connection with each other? And so we did a, a, we used a technique called GRASP, which is, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is a, is a very cool technique, it was initially developed in C. elegans, where you express one half of the GFP on all presynaptic neurons, and, and the other half of the GFP on all postsynaptic neurons, well, postsynaptic location. And so if those are close enough, and close enough to make a, to form a synapsis, then the GFP, GFP will reconstitute and you will see a signal. And so when we did GRASP in this way, we do see a signal, so we do see synapses between the PDF presynaptic connection and the nana postsynaptic connection. So it tells you that they, actually the, the, the nina and nana form slightly indirect circuit where PDF neurons, to which nina belong, connect to nana neurons. And so this is quite cool if you think about it, because it, we already seen is a, is a gene that is, uh, you know, uh, so one promoter, but two different splicing isoforms. The one splicing isoform is uh, circadian, and the other splicing isoform is homeostatic, possibly, and, uh, and then they merge and they create these circuits. It's quite, it's quite a scene. Um, <clears throat> whether um, the nanoneurons are um, really homeostatic, we're still 100% sure, but we have good evidence that they do alone control sleep. And again, this is an experiment where they, we associate them to homeostasis. So we look at the expression of nana in these neurons uh, after uh, sleep deprivation, for instance, and you see the nana goes up after sleep deprivation in those neurons. Um, and we look at also the calcium signal in those neurons after sleep deprivation, and you see that the calcium signal goes down after sleep deprivation. So what, what we think is happening is that uh, as, uh, the, as the animal gets 
is lift the price, nana goes up, the signal, the, the firing potential of these uh, neurons goes down, uh, and this leads to a more, being more tired and the animal falls asleep. So uh, that's the case. You should expect that when you activate those neurons, you get the opposite phenotype. And so we did this experiment. We, again, we use uh, the thermogenetic tools, 3 one to express 3 one in the control of, of the nana gal 4 uh, activate, uh, raise the temperature, and what you see when you raise the temperature is a decrease in sleep amount. The decrease in sleep amount, interestingly enough, is uh, dependent on uh, the amount of light that you have in the chamber. Um, if you do it in LD conditions, you see that it happens only during uh, dark phase, even though it's already active during the light phase. But if you do it in DD condition, then it happens throughout 24 hours. So we're not quite sure what that means. But uh, it clearly shows that these neurons are able to activate, uh, uh, modulate sleep. And so there is, um, this is the, the, the overall picture imagining so far. You have uh, the NINA uh, component of the gene expressing circadian neurons and the NANA component expressing uh, homeostatic neurons. And they merge together and they regulate sleep in this way. Now, there's one thing I didn't tell you, which it might well be the most interesting thing, in fact. And this is relates to the structure of these of this proteins, okay? So what we did is we look at the uh, same gene, Ninalana gene, across um, several sequenced uh, Drosophila species. Now, you cannot read this, but when you do uh, this alignment, you will find that they share all the critical AKR residues, which you expect, with one exception. The exception is here in this pocket indicated in orange. The uh, Nina. Um, genes are <coughs> canonical. They do have the orange residues, but the nana isoforms are not. They actually have a conserved substitution of these orange residues, which is very unusual. What are these orange re residues? They, they are here. These are the four residues that bind the phosphate group in NADPH. And they are important because if you remove, it is shown in vitro that if you remove these residues, then the protein does not have affinity for NADPH anymore, but it gains affinity for NADH, right? which is the same molecule without the phosphate group. And so it's not a canonical AKR, because it does not most likely use NADPH to work, but it uses NADH. And so why is this important then? Because uh, now you have a potential sensor for NADPH expressing circadian neurons, and a potential sensor for NADH expressing homeostatic neurons. And ADPH and ADH are two, as you know, very critical you know, cofactors for the cell. They reflect very much the energy state of the cell. They reflect the redox state of the cell. And ADPH was shown a few years ago to be a, a circadian reinforcer of the clock. So there was a fantastic paper from, by John O'Neill a few years ago where they looked at uh, red blood cells. And red blood cells are enucleated. Right? They don't have a nucleus. They cannot have transcription. Yet, they have circadian rhythm. So because everything we know about circadian rhythm is driven by transcription, the question is, how can they have a circadian rhythm if they don't have a nucleus? And the answer is, they maintain, they look at the levels of an ADPH and the ratio of an ADPH, and the ratio of, uh, of an ADPH will tell them what time of the day it is. So they use an ADPH as a proxy for uh, circadian in absence of transcription. And actually, the superchasmatic nucleus in mammals is shown to also use the same mechanism as a reinforcer for transcription. So why is this cool then? Because then we have a sensor for NADPH, which is the circadian reinforcer in the circadian neurons. And we have a potential sensor for NADH in these homeostatic neurons. So the, 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 the hypothesis we're putting forward is that actually NADH might be a sensor of uh, um, sleep pressure. And uh, as you sleep or are awake, the levels of NADH change in your brain, sensor might pick it up, and, and, and this is how neurons know whether you should go to sleep or not in terms of homeostasis. And so that's uh, really the model uh, at this point. It's very simplified. Um, and we're working on this um, NADH, NADPH hypothesis. All right, so I close it here. The work I show today, um, the first part, the sex part, was mainly uh, so was done by Esteban. It was actually an Argentinian postdoc in the lab on his way to independence now. And the Nina Nana story was uh, started by Anne, who has now uh, left the lab to go for a postdoc in, uh, in Germany. And, and, uh, and yeah, this is the other members. And thank you, everyone. I take your questions now.